Thank you, Nama, for this fancy introduction, and thanks for the invitation. Um, thank you, everyone, who made the heroic efforts to come here this early in the morning. So just can you please mark me five minutes uh, before I run out of time? So I would, like, I would like to show you something that I don't know if this qualifies as uh, artificial intelligence. I guess this is more uh, human intelligence with, with a blend of uh, delicate uh, statistical methods. But basically, um, I think as it was mentioned, I, um, I work mainly in the domains of vision and uh, machine learning and somehow midway upon the journey of my life, I, I decided that I would like to find uh, new adventures and I adventured into computational chemistry and uh, structural biology. And this happened about three years ago when I, I met this uh, uh, triple A team, which I'm one of the A, and by the way, the molecule that uh, Ailey Marks is uh, holding here is, is a triple, uh, triple alanine uh, peptide, the, the triple A. So, so we, uh, she came to me about three years ago with, a, with what appar apparently was a crazy uh, hypothesis that she proposed to, to check computationally and then experimentally, and this is what I would like to show you, uh, to show you today. <laughs> So just before, before that, I don't know what is the background of people present here, I would like to give you a very brief uh, three-minute introduction about how, how uh, proteins work. So this is, this is um, a magnified view of the incredible uh, molecular machinery that, uh, that exists in our cells, everything that, that is alive. And you, you basically see all the biological macromolecules at scale at the right concentration. So if in textbooks of, in biology you see a cell filled with water and a few things floating, that's, not, uh, that, that's a lie. This is how it looks like. It is very dense, densely packed. Probably more than one third of these molecules are proteins. So these are the, the nano uh, machines that uh, make things alive. And just, uh, again, a brief intro how proteins are created. It's, it's actually a very, it's an amazing process. Um, the, the instructions for building up a protein are stored in, in our DNA, in, in every living cell. It is a very robust uh, biomolecule that is made of a double, uh, double helix. It, it is made for storing information. And the first stage in creating a, a protein is, is called transcription. A, a special uh, machine that is called RNA polymerase uh, translates the information that is coded in DNA in the language of four letters, a sequences of four letters that are called nucleotides. Uh, they are transcribed into what is called a messenger RNA molecule, which is a very short-lived and unstable molecule that is used just for intermediate uh, uh, storage of information. And then the mRNA enters another uh, wonderful machine that is called the ribosome that uh, reads the instructions in the, in the mRNA and creates a peptide chain. So basically the way, the way this machine works, we, we have an alphabet of 20 amino acids that, uh, that build up proteins and only four nucleotides that build up mRNA. So there is a translation table from triplets of nucleotides to uh, to the 20 amino acids that are basically these triplets are called codons and there is a molecule that knows how to speak the language of peptides and uh, and genetic uh, molecules so the, the, this, this molecule is called tRNA and it knows how to the, how to read out the specific codon and bring the right amino acid to the growing peptide chain and then it exits the ribosome and by by electrostatic interactions and thermodynamic uh, forces the protein folds into its uh, three-dimensional structure that uh, confers it the, uh, the function that it needs to, it needs to have in, in our cells. The point is that if you, make, if, you, if you do a brief calculation, you have 64 ways of organizing, basically of 64 possibilities of organizing a codon and only 20 amino acids. So there is a redundancy in this genetic code, for example, uh, the amino acid valine has four uh, ways of being encoded. And there are some amino acids that are encoded by, by six possibilities, some amino acids are encoded by four, 
uh, a particular amino acid, which is called isoleucine, is, is encoded by three. And basically, there is redundancy. I don't think there is a clear answer why life exactly decided on this code, but it is universal to all, to all living things. Okay? And I would like to go back to a series of experiments that have been carried out in the end of the 60s and in the 70s, specifically by Christian Anfinsen and other scientists that showed that you can unfold a working protein and then remove the denaturing uh, agent, it will fold again and it will regain its function. So it means that, that basically the native structure of the protein is just a thermodynamic equilibrium which is only determined by the amino acid sequence of the protein completely in complete disregard of how exactly it was translated. Okay, so basically it means that the protein doesn't remember the genetic code from which, from which, uh, from which it was translated. Once you have the amino acid sequence, that's what determines the structure line. Okay? And for that, for that set of experiments, Anfinser, of course, got his Nobel Prize. However, there is a mounting evidence uh, that uh, what is called synonymous mutations. So basically, they are called, uh, they are called silent mutations uh, very often in biology because they, they are thought to be inconsequential, changing the coding of amino acid without changing the amino acid. So these are the mutations, the silent mutations. They, uh, they, there is mounting evidence that these mutations are implicated in disease. They might affect how the, the, how the protein functions. Uh, the exact mechanism is not known. There are some mechanisms that are related to, to secondary structures of the mRNA molecule, for example, and some other phenomena, but basically it is not, there is no agreement on how exactly uh, so-called silent mutations are not, not exactly silent. And basically the hypothesis that we wanted to check is whether uh, the, the genetic coding, synonymous genetic coding, has any consequence on local backbone structure of the proteins. So according to the dogma, and this is one of the central tenets of today's structural biology, is that uh, no matter how you encode your amino acid sequence, it will fall to the same structure. It will be overwhelmed by uh, electrostatic interactions and thermodynamic, uh, uh, thermodynamic gradients. And the hypothesis that we're making that, are, of course, we're not trying to refute that claim categorically. Of course, in most proteins, most places in the, in the protein, that would be the case. But we would like to see if there exist any particular locations where there is an additional factor that is related to genetic coding that might affect structure, right? So we would obviously like to see some, some causal direction here. Okay, so just in terms of how to characterize structure, I'm going to, to use this in the, in the sequel. Um, if you look at the, at the protein here, I'm showing a sequence of several amino acids. So amino acids are just shared uh, triplets of atoms, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, uh, and to one of the carbons, a side chain is appended that determines the chemistry of the specific amino acid. And basically, if you look just at the backbone formed by this nitrogen, carbon, carbon, you can measure the, the hydral angles between these pairs of planes, and this fully describes the geometry of the backbone. And if you look at this pair of, amino, uh, of, of uh, the hydral angles phi and psi, that, uh, that characterizes a single amino acid. You can plot them in a two-dimensional plot that was introduced about 70 years ago by Ramachandran. Sorry. I don't know where all the dots are gone in this plot, but they, it should be filled with dots. So basically, there are, you will see a distribution I will describe by words what you are supposed to see here. Uh, you are supposed to see uh, a, few, um, a few peaks in this distribution of the hydral angles that are characteristic of specific secondary structural elements of the, of the protein, specifically alpha helices and, and beta strands. So this is a very typical way to determine, uh, to characterize local structure in proteins. Basically what we did in, in a paper that we published uh, a year ago in Nature Communications was, was, was the following. We uh, created a data set of um, local protein structures uh, aligned with their genetic coding. So apparently it is something that is difficult to obtain uh, to start with because, because synonymous mutations are considered to be inconsequential. So genetic data is not even deposited to the protein data bank. Nobody cares. There is no, no way to deposit genetic sequences there. 
So we, we, we had to do some acrobatics to, to actually get a reliable um, determination of the, of, the, of, the, of the specific codons that were used to, uh, to express the proteins. And then we calculated those Ramachandran flocks, those uh, distributions of the dihedral angles, uh, conditioned by the, um, by the by specific synonymous codons of a single amino acid. And then we saw that these distributions uh, are distinct, at least for some amino acids, for some coding pairs, we see uh, distinct distributions. And, and again, there, there is delicate statistical tools that we had to develop to actually make sure that we get something significant that we test for multiple hypotheses, uh, uh, basically for multiple hypothesis tests and so on. So we, we observed that at least there are some amino acids that, uh, that have, let's say, association, that have, uh, that have significant um, uh, statistical dependence between the uh, identity of the synonymous codon and the distribution of these dihedral angles. Then we, we did a very, very, very straightforward experiment. We tried, we, of course, we didn't build anything uh, clo close to alpha fold, but we tried to predict local um, backbone structure from, uh, from the amino acid sequence, and in, in parallel to that, from the amino acid sequence plus the genetic information about the coding, and we saw an improvement in the prediction uh, performance, and also the other way around. So basically, this, this is kind of an, a separate channel suggesting that there is some additional information contained about the protein structure that, uh, that, that the genetic code has. And we got quite, uh, we got quite interesting, uh, uh, quite interesting, I would say, bimodal distribution of reactions to this paper. Some pap people say that this is insane, and some people say that this is nonsense and this cannot be true. Uh, and, well, I, I respect both opinions. Uh, uh, so, so one of the things, of course, uh, the ultimate proof would be in an experimental, an experimental, uh, uh, ex basically, a wet experiment that demonstrates that this is true. But this distributional study, of course, doesn't pinpoint concrete uh, proteins with concrete locations that can be uh, brought to the lab and experimented with. So we wanted to find actually a list of uh, possible uh, candidate targets that we can explore experimentally. And this is what we have done recently. This is a paper that is currently uh, under review. Basically, what we would like to, to do here is to identify uh, pairs of uh, very similar uh, um, homologous proteins that have very similar sequences, uh, that have very similar structures, like the two proteins that you can see here on the left. Uh, they have very similar structures, but in some locations, they have very distinctly, uh, di very distinct conformations of the backbone, like, like an oxygen flip a peptide flip that, that is about a 180 degrees change in the, the hydrogen angles. And of course you can say, but well, this is just the influence of the environment. For example, if it is an experimentally determined structure, it might be crystallized in different conditions, might be packed in the crystal in a different way. So, so it's just the influence of that crystal packing, for example, and many other confounding factors. So probably the most delicate part of this work was to try to get rid of these confounding factors. I'm not completely sure that we got read of all of them, but at least we tried hard. So, so basically what we are looking for are uh, pairs of structures that are, first of all, similar. They have the same sequence in some window. So let's say this is a reference. This is another protein that looks very similar. It has the same sequence, RGPF in this case. But you see a confounding factor. There is a ligand floating somewhere in solution. So that ligand could create, an, uh, let's say, an electrostatic interaction that might twist the backbone into, into a different position. So that's not good. Instead of a ligand, it could be just another chain of the same protein or a different protein. So that, that's also not good, right? Because amino acids are sticky. They, they create electrostatic interaction. This is, also, this is a more delicate case. This is, not, uh, this is not a good match as well. Because you see, there is this amino acid that was changed from Q to L. So Q created a hydrogen bond to the backbone of that uh, that G, and this L cannot create this bond anymore. So that might explain, that might, you can say that that mutation caused the difference in the, in the background. So we want to exclude these kind of matches as well. And this is, this is an example of a good match because we have a backbone in a different conformation. We still have that Q that could have formed the hydrogen bond, but it didn't because of some reason. So again, we are not, 
we we are short of claiming causality here, but but we but at least these are the good uh, the good matches that we are looking for. So I'm just showing you a, a snapshot of a se of several uh, of several um, uh, protein structures here that we found. So in all cases, we are, we were looking for backbone uh, differences that are bigger than 60 degree 60 degrees uh, in the heated angle. Something that cannot be explained by uh, any measurement in precision or other things. You can see that if you look at the experimentally determined electron densities in these crystallographic <coughs> experiments, uh, all these structures are actually well modeled. So you cannot say that it's something that is, that is not modeled well and the electron density shows something different. So well, well modeled structures. Uh, but l looking at a protein like this, like something frozen in time, that's, that's a white lie, right? Because a real protein is something like this. So this is an output of a molecular dynamics simulation. We wanted to see how, how these conformations actually behave when we put them in simulation, in solution, completely stripped of the crystal context of uh, any ligands, any cofactors that might be present in the original structure. So this is an example of, of a protein that has two, uh, two uh, alternative conformations. You see here in this violin plot, these are the distributions of the dihedral angles over very long dynamic simulations. And you see that the two conformations are stable. They remain stable. So th th this is kind of two uh, dips in the energy landscape of that, of that protein. So they, they remain stable and, well, they, it might fold into either of them because of some, some mechanisms. Now, you can say that, well, it might be that these proteins are not, they are not exactly the same. There might be some subtle uh, long uh, distance interactions in the environment that still um, shapes the energy landscape in such a way that in one case you prefer one conformation and in another you prefer another. So what we did, we synthetically created chimera structures by transplanting a short loop from one protein to the environment of the other and then running dynamics again. And basically we see that at least the examples that we, that we are reporting in the paper, they survive this simulation, some, some don't. And basically that conformation still remains stable in the other protein's environment. Okay, another interesting, or maybe anecdotal thing is that uh, in all these cases, alpha fold predicts the structure of the protein exquisitely well, like RMSD 0.8 angstrom, except that particular region that we are, we, are, uh, we are highlighting. It typically knows how to predict one of the conformations very accurately, and the other one is not predicted well in both, in both proteins. So it might suggest, I'm not claiming that it, this is necessarily the case, but it might suggest that there is some additional uh, set of factors outside of the information contained in, in the amino acid sequence related to the translation process itself that might be influencing the structure of the protein. So just, just one last slide and I'm finished. So, so just to summarize, we, we, what we show is a statistical dependence between synonymous coding and the structure of the protein backbone. We cannot claim causality without making wet experiments. We are currently doing many wet experiments and we have another batch of crystals going to uh, the ESRF facility in June. Uh, and hopefully next time if you invite me, I will show you uh, already an experimental confirmation of what we are trying to find. Thank you. So, so, in, in, so just to avoid the dependence on the expression system, we analyzed only E. coli proteins in E. coli. And for this, for this second work that I showed, we organized everything expressed in E. coli. So we want the expression system to be... Yes, and the, the second, the expression system is E. coli and the proteins come from different species. And we, well, again, there, there are some amino acids that can be codon optimized it's very, it's very rare to do codon optimization in E. coli, at least for its own native uh, proteins. Right? So I think that's, that puts us in a relatively safe ground. We don't have enough data. We, we, would, we would love to, but we don't have enough data. One last question. Uh, yes, please. I would like to ask a question. First, when I was in the 
Of course. So basically, you're saying that the causation direction might be opposite because of some evolutionary biases. Yeah, of course, that, that could be a possible explanation. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we, we need the wet experiments targeted to probe for the causation direction. Thank you.